So hello everyone, I'm Greg Cervani. I'm here to talk to you guys today about creating new music apps. Now, I'm super lucky in that I'm able to do what I love for my job, and that's creating music apps. I work with artists, I work with startups, I work with people in the industry, and I just do this, uh, do this all the time, and it's, it's awesome. And so when Colin asked me, he said, Greg, will you come do a talk uh, on, maybe on something on audio, I was like, yeah, of course. Like, there, I could talk all day about audio stuff, all the stuff I've learned, all the stuff I think. Um, but then as I was turning it over in my mind, I was like, wouldn't it be like way cooler, or wouldn't it be a lot more valuable to like reach out to the top of the app store, to like the people that I think are doing the most interesting and creative work, and sort of like pick their brains and talk to them about what they think is cool in apps. Um, so I did that, so I, I reached out and uh, I reached out to uh, half a dozen people and said, hey, I want to talk to you about your app, your design process, your development process, what goes into it, and, uh, and use this for a talk. And I figured half of them would get back, back to me and half of them would just ignore it. But 100% of them like, emailed me back within 12 hours and were like, yes, totally, like, let's do it. And so like, this community is great. Like, everyone was super nice and super open about their work and what they do. Um, and I've got a lot of co content to cover, so I'm just going to dive into it. I'm going to do kind of high-level topics and thoughts on each application framework. Um, and I'll be talking about different uh, technologies and tools they use. Uh, I hope this kind of serves as maybe as like a rabbit hole for you, or maybe like a gatepost that you see something that you might attach to, like maybe you have a certain background that that appeals to you. And then that gives you maybe a, a way to get started creating something cool. So first up, uh, first up is patterning, and uh, patterning is a uh, circular rhythm-based drum machine uh, available on the iPad. Uh, it's best here if we just like take a take a look at the video. So that's patterning. Uh, patterning comes from Olympia Noise Co. That's uh, run by a solo indie developer, uh, Ben. Ben is an a instructor, is a, a lecturer at Evergreen State College uh, up in Olympia, where he teaches electronic music uh, and composition. He studied music technology and composition. Um, and uh, he's, not, he's not an engineer. He's, he's not an engineer by trade. Um, he, he's definitely a, a music person and he got really into Max, which is a, uh, which is a visual design language for creating, uh, creating audio programs and he started using it in around 2000 and this is a quote from him where he said, I designed so many in instruments in Max over the years that it helped me to keep the big picture in mind. So this is somebody that has a deep level understanding of electronic music a deep level understanding of composition, and then he's used a powerful synthesis environment to program things out. So when it got to like creating an app, he's just he's just working off of his mind, off of designs he's made over and over again or in different ways, and just looking up how to program those kinds of things. So to give you an idea of what Max is, Max looks like this. This is a visual programming language which is, uh, which is kind of interesting. Everything is done in this way in which you, you have these objects that you connect to other objects in order to make sounds. And what it does is it gives you a lot of tools and a way to think about synthesis. So if you use something like this, you can develop the kind of thought process that's required to make, make uh, audio software. 
And so he used this in his experiment experience um, to create a library of C-based functions. So everything in patterning that we were seeing was all based on a C function that he wrote. He's not using anybody else's uh, anybody else's tech. He's using Core Audio and Audio Graphs and the Accelerate framework to make sure everything's running quickly. And then he built a library for all the oscillators and filters and LFOs and effects and line generators and everything he needed in order to make these instruments. And if you dig into patterning, it's a very rich app that offers a lot of features. So he would go off and he would spend three weeks learning to program a really good reverb by looking at open source, uh, different open source offerings uh, from like textbooks or from like Karma. Karma's the uh, research institute at uh, Stanford, the arm that studies computer music. Um, they have a bunch of C++ code uh, there, and he's, you know, he, being a non-developer, he's like, I don't know C++, I know enough C to build my iPhone apps, I know how to do my iPhone apps, I know Macs. So we'd go in there and get the idea of it, and then convert it into a low-level C function, and put it into his application. Which leads to functionality like this. They are using his app and rapidly switching between the different presets. And had he been using like some of the out of the box Apple technologies to play samples and to play sounds, like that would not be that responsive. Since he's manually managing all the buffers being loaded and all that stuff, it actually gives him the freedom to do more cool things like that. Uh, next up, Easy Audio. Uh, Easy Audio is a framework. Um, Probably the best way uh, if you want the simplest and uh, uh, lowest uh, commitment from an audio framework. This is made by a guy named uh, Harris, and he started before he started working on this before we had AV Foundation in iOS. So uh, if you started with iOS at the beginning, like it wasn't it wasn't very easy to make your apps make music. That was a challenge just in itself. And a lot of it was, as he described it, like a dark secret. So he would reach out to the engineers at the other uh, music companies out in Silicon Valley and ask them what they were doing or how they were getting it to work. And then he pulled all these things together into a library of uh, frameworks to, to, to make that easy and more accessible. And so he put them all into Easy Audio. And they're all decoupled and they all, they all work either independently or as a group or whatever you, whatever you want to do. So if you want something that, say, like, plots a waveform, like that technology is not built into iOS, like, but you can get the Easy Audio Plotter in uh, OpenGL, Easy Audio Plot GL, and that'll help you do that really quickly. Um, a few quick demos of this, like here's, uh, here's the recording and waveform generation. Here's an FFT, so detecting pitch in audio. This is a non-trivial task. That's easy audio. Fugue machine. Fugue machine is super cool. Okay, let's show a video of that. So how do you go about creating something like this? So this is um, 
this is Alex Alexander Knott, is, is what he makes music as and release apps as. So he's another indie developer that is also an artist and a performer. Um, he has a background in music technology. He studied electrical engineering, and then he went and he did startups at Georgia Tech in the music tech space. So this person's probably out of all of them, like one of the most qualified to be doing music technology, right? Um, and then in between doing his apps and his performances, he also leads uh, lectures on creative computing at the Gray Area, um, Gray Area Institute, the Gray Area Festival, he's got an event coming up in a few weeks, he's also doing it at MoFest. Um, so when he started this problem, when he started this, this app, he wanted to work in counterpoint. He wanted to take the technologies that Bach used uh, to compose and open them up and kind of explore them in a new and fun way. And he did this by using Max for Live, Touch OSC, Lemur, and native iOS uh, interfaces. Give me an idea what that looks like. So Max, like we just talked about before, but Max hooked up to Ableton Live, and Ableton Live is an audio workstation. Um, so it takes all the customize, customize, customization you can do with Max and pairs it with a, a really uh, world-class audio production environment. And so when he started this, he, um, he, said, uh, he said to me, he said, Greg, I built two machine in 30 minutes in Max. And then it take, took me eight months to build it on the I, or for the iPad, right? So to give you an idea of kind of how that enables you, right? And then he used uh, he used apps like Lemur and Touch OSC. Lemur is an iPad app that does a whole bunch of really cool um, controls uh, that basically sends messages to other apps. You could use it with uh, you could use it with Ableton, or you could use it with other software. Same thing as uh, Touch OSC. But how how people like Alex are using it is they're using it with their Max patches, and they're using it with Ableton to test their interfaces, to be like, oh, is this a fun musical device? And they just have a little XY pad, and then, and then uh, they move on to see whether, uh, whether or not this is working in the prototyping phase. And what he largely found is that the experiments really eliminated interfaces. So he thought maybe an XY would be a good interface for a, for a contra, contrapuntal uh, music device, but it turned out it really wasn't. And he tried a few other things. Um, and then he got the idea for the multiple playhead idea. And when he got the idea for the, for the multiple playheads, he said, that is so obvious to me. Like, that seems like such a good answer. Someone has got to have invented this already. So he went out and searched for it and couldn't find it anywhere. It was like, okay, well, I guess I need to build that. And when he got to that part, that's when it had to become a native iOS application. Right? So, because within Lemur or within Touch OSC, you have simple bars and buttons and things like that. You can do some customization with Canvas and other things. But at some point, you get to, you get to an interface that you really need to get in and start custom coding. And in this instance, that's what, uh, this is what he did. And he paid a lot of attention to making sure it was an iPad application first. Not something ported to iPad, not something that runs on iPad, but that experience that is best had on it on a tablet, on an iPad that you're touching and moving around. Uh, for frameworks, so he took, uh, he took a little bit, um, he used more frameworks than, than Ben did. He's using the amazing audio engine, which we'll talk about in a little bit, which is a great framework that helps you, um, helps you kind of set up your audio graphs and things within an iOS application. He used PG MIDI, he's customized it a little bit. That helps you manage MIDI connections and how your software is talking to other applications. And he used AU Sampler, which is an out-of-the-box uh, sampler that just plays notes, comes ships with iOS, it's iOS 6. And he also dog foods his own software. So this is him playing at an event with his app. And you can see that it's patterning app right next to it. And he has some music hardware there too that, that is also doing uh, uh, voices and drum backs.
they definitely they definitely care a lot about their apps, and it shows that they're out there using them and, and performing with them and using them in the real world. Um, the amazing audio engine. Has, has anyone heard of the amazing audio engine? All right, the amazing audio engine is awesome. I built a few apps in it. Um, like when it came out, I think there was a collective hooray from all of the audio devs working in iOS because it was the audio engine we all kind of needed but hadn't gotten around to making. Um, and Michael Tyson is just a, an amazing guy who's, who's done a lot for the community. Here's a, here's a demo video of what's going on with the uh, amazing audio engine too. everything as he writes it, and he's treating it as it's, if it's an API. I asked him, I said, hey, if I opened up Loopy and like looked at your like uh, file storage or persistence layer, would it look the same as the audio engine stuff? He's like, yeah, it would be pretty well documented in there. And so what he did is he, he wrote up a blog after doing Loopy and uh, put out a bunch of his uh, tips and tricks he'd learned from making core audio applications. There were so many people that came and read that blog and I got so much attention, he was like, well, I guess I should open search that part of my app. And since he had already done all the legwork of creating a good API and a good doc, he just pulled it out and tidied it up a little bit and pushed it out there. And that's the amazing audio engine. And it's open source and it's been used all over the place. Um, and then he also, he also uh, built AudioBus, which was the technology before Apple introduced InterApp Audio, was the only way that two apps could speak musically to each other that one could play music that the other one could process as an effect, or vice versa, or record, or whatever. It was a way for apps to communicate with audio. So that guy's done a lot of amazing things, but uh, amazing audio engine is the focus of this one. And so in version one, what it did basically is it took all the audiograph stuff that you have to do in an iPhone app to uh, use that Apple code to mix channels and set up instruments or record things and take input. And he abstracted it and made it a lot easier. So you can just be like, add a channel, add a channel, tap a 
tap an effect onto this channel, record this, render this. Um, and, and what it resulted in is kind of a large controller that you can, uh, you can base all of your audio programming off of. And so after several years and several applications being built on this platform, they just recently announced a version two. And this, takes a com this is a complete rewrite. It takes a different approach to audio application development. So you can still use version one, and version one is still going to be updated for some time. But version two is a totally different approach in which it's all based on a buffer stack. So instead of having a graph in which things are pulling from each other to make music, it is a buffer stack in which buffers of audio are placed onto a stack and then rendered out uh, in, in render blocks. And this is, a, this is a lot more modular than the first approach. The first approach was kind of a large uh, framework that you had to use all the parts. You couldn't really pick and choose and say, I want to use your sample playback or I want to use this. With this new modular approach, you should be able to uh, pick and choose what you want to use, kind of uh, how Easy Audio is, is working. So kind of take what you want. So that beta was just released, that code is available, that video, we've got a good introduction video on that stuff. So that's a cool, new, interesting space to watch. So the last one I'm gonna, the last app, I've got another framework yet, is uh, Elastic Drums. synthesizer. So all those sounds are being synthesized. They are being created from basically nothing, from some uh, different waveforms that are being affected and filtered and, and whatnot. All right, let's dig a little bit more into Elastic Drum. So what this is doing is it's a synthesizer and not a sampler in that conventional sense of like playing back recorded audio files. It's, it's generating that. There's a whole bunch of different, uh, there's a whole bunch of different instruments available. There's a whole bunch of different knobs to tweak. He created it to kind of be a nerd instrument with tons of parameters. And the way he started was with another, yet another synthesis environment called Reactor. Reactor comes from Native Instruments, who makes Tractor and uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, different plugins and machine and contact sampler, tons of different uh, products that make DJ software. And they make this one called Reactor that allows you to patch up and create a synthesis environment. So he had created a patch that synthesized drum beats, and he was controlling it with a manual joystick. And he said, this is super cool, like I want to turn this into an app. But he was a multimedia and web programmer. He wasn't a music tech engineer. He wasn't someone uh, with a composition background. So he said, you know, how do I do this? And his first thought was like, okay, well, this is a big, hairy app. I'm going to target an iPhone so I can kind of bring my vision in a little bit. And, and limit it to that screen size. Um, and then he took all of his experience from using a whole bunch of different platforms. Like he's not someone that's like, oh, I use Max for 10 years. He's like, I use a little bit of Max, I use a little bit of Pure Data, I use a little, little bit of Super Collider, and, and like brought all that diverse experience in there. And then all kind of centered around a iPad-centric music approach. Not say, saying like, I want to make music just on my iOS devices. I don't want to use, you know, uh, with, with a DAW running. So what that looks like, what the and, and, and solution ended up looking like, is using uh, is using pure data. So pure data is basically uh, in a similar similar scope of Max, right? It's a visual programming language that lets you create new synthesis programs, whether it's from sampling or whether it's from um, generation. And so this is a, a library that he used called. DIY library that was built to uh, kind of organize a bunch of different different synthesis patches. And so he took this pure data library and he started picking apart the pieces he wanted, started cutting parts out because, uh, because once you use something like this, the processing, it, it becomes more intensive. But the advantage that pure data has over something like Max is you can actually put pure data patches on your phone. 
So while Max Packs exist today mainly as something that you build on your computer or you embed in live or you use it to talk to other instruments, Pure Data is something that has platforms that are available. LibPD is a wrapper for iOS or you can get it on a Raspberry Pi or you can put it in, a, in a, you can put this environment in a variety of places. So with that comes complexity that the number of voices you choose, the number of effects in your chain, that's gonna start eating up a whole bunch of bandwidth on your, or a whole bunch of processing time on your phone. So that means you gotta kinda of cut out and carefully pick and choose what adds the most value to the sound while simultaneously managing the resources on the device. And this thing runs on an iPhone 4S. So he's gotten it down to the, the kind of most performant aspects of the, of the sound generation. And he released it with a, um, with a collaboration. Uh, Mouse on Mars is an electronic uh, performing artist. And he was showing them a preview of his app. And he said, hey, we're doing this weird thing where we're going to kind of create a label for instruments. And we're going to do distribution of a bunch of uh, different kind of like future instruments. We'd love to put your, put your app in there. So he released it with Mouse on Mars, with RetchUp, and a few other cool applications uh, that they, they put out. And he, too, is. Um, is active in performing. That's Oliver on the end there. He wrote the software. I'm going to play a little uh, session now or jam. Uh, all apps are linked with Ableton Link. And yeah, after that, we will uh, present our uh, own apps. Okay, I hope the jam will work very well. So let's begin. <laughs> started was with a, a musical game that the developer had created. He's a PhD in another field. 
he had created a musical game and he put it up on Kickstarter. And somebody reached out to him and said, you know, I'm not super into the game, but could you use your technology for this? You want to use it for your training. And he said, oh, well, maybe the value in my creation is not necessarily the game, but maybe it's the, maybe it's the audio framework that I created. And so he created this, and he did version one, and then he did version two, which added some uh, added some ways to do it interactively. And then now in version three, it's gotten to the point that you can run it in an interactive playground. What his kind of objective is now is shortening the feedback loop. So if you were to program your iPhone to make music, and you didn't have this musical mind that spent a decade in synthesis environments, if you were a performer and you knew exactly how you wanted to build your app and how you wanted it to act, the cycle of writing code in Xcode, compiling, running, and pressing buttons to see if your app was musical is too long. And that, that, it, that kind of inhibits serendipity, that inhibits like the random doodles and chance of like, I plugged this into this and now it's making a weird noise that I never expected, but that's actually the direction I want to go in. And so with his work now, he's working out um, in making it kind of the audio environment of choice. If you're an iOS developer or you're a Mac developer and you want to create something, uh, you want to create something musical. So this focus now is shortening the feedback loop. And here's an example. Nari does a great job of organizing this open source project. There's tons of documentation, tons of videos, uh, tons of stuff to download, um, and all these kind of cool toys to, to play with. Here's another one that uh, does yet another kind of interactive element to it. Synthesizer benefits, the guy who makes a drum machine benefits because there's that ecosystem is that much richer. 
and Michael Tyson with like even the work he did on like Audio Bus like made, I mean, the amazing audio engine aside, like Audio Bus made it possible to write effects on the app. Like you could even make some of these apps without, without this other technology. So it's a very, very cool space where everyone's like super, super helpful. And uh, that's it. I'll open up to questions. Happy to talk about any topics or anything.